Oh, guys, you understand the thing that we've been talking about this entire first unit is getting you ready to work in lab effectively. And we started this unit by talking about data, we talked about measurements, we talked about accuracy, we talked about estimation, we talked about significant digits, and then we finally did a big day about lab safety and all of the things that you need to know in order to work in lab effectively and, uh, and safely. So guys, with that said, let's go back to the calendar and let's now talk about how the rest of this unit is going to unfold. So guys, today um, there are th this is going to be a day going through those notes pages that you have in front of you. And guys, this is going to become your instruction manual for when you go to lab at the end of the week. So on Friday, well a little bit on Wednesday, but on Friday we're finally going to go into lab and you're going to go in there and you're going to start lighting Bunsen burners and react things together and filtering and boiling and condensing and collecting and all this other stuff and this is going to be the way to do all of that so guys what we're going to do today is we're going to go over all of these skills techniques and mathematical things that you need to understand and this you will take with you to lab at least the first couple times you go because it's really helpful to have a reference so guys that's what today is going to be about then when we get back together on Wednesday, it will be our short day. You already know that. It's uh, our, our short Wednesday day. There's one more concept that we need to talk about. We will break you then. Well, we'll reposition in the room. Guys, when you come in here on Wednesday, you're going to see that table blocking your path into the room. And on that table will be printed copies of our new seating chart that I will build off of your guys' seating preference preferences and we'll then reorganize the room we'll quickly talk about density and then we will uh, get up in lab we'll get you settled into lab a little bit more and that'll be our day to day that day then guys this is where lab really starts to get a little more involved so Friday will be in lab no school Monday Wednesday we will wrap up the lab that we did on Friday then Friday of the next week you will be in lab again then and coming back on Tuesday, we will wrap up that lab, talk with you about how to study for our first unit test, and guys, our first unit test will be the 16th. So that's the schedule for the rest of this. Again, today is skills that you need in lab, then a little bit of new stuff Wednesday, and then guys, following that, we just break into this, this rotation where you're gonna be in and out of lab for two full cycles, and then uh, the test will be at the end of that. So questions about the calendar or any of this stuff? So um, guys, if you know that you're gonna miss anywhere along the way, please come and talk with me ahead of time. If you do miss, if you get sick or something like that, guys, all you gotta do is come and talk with me. Um, that's obviously the key to this, is just communicate with me and your other teachers. So guys, anything there? You guys are good? All right. So guys, with that said then, grab that sheet of paper, though all that packet of papers that you have in front of you. Let me click on a couple things to clean up my mess here. And that goes away. That goes away. We need this. And we need... Wait for it. We need this. All right. So guys, um, let me help you get settled to how you're going to interact with today. So, guys, obviously you have the notes in front of you, but the notes that you have in front of you are simply the talking points that are also going to come up on the screen. They are not complete. They are not enough to help you be successful in lab. So what you're going to do is with something that you can write with, you're going to underline, you're going to highlight, you're going to star, you're going to jot notes to yourself. You're going to be writing down things that I point out to you that are important and and along the way, we're going to help you get ready for lab. So guys, these are the things we're going to do. First of all, we're going to talk about lab skills. These are things that you have got to be able to do in lab in order to be successful. Then we're going to talk about techniques. And the question is, what are the difference between techniques and skills? And guys, the answer is this. Techniques are things that you could do differently 
and be successful, but you're just not doing them, hey, just one second, you're just not doing them correctly. And so guys, techniques are fine tuning things. They're things that you need to keep in mind in order to be truly successful in lab. And then guys, we're going to talk about one more concept. We're going to talk about the math of that concept. You will have homework as a result of this tonight and you'll have a little bit of time to work on that as we go. So guys, there's one thing I need to do really quickly stepping next door and then we're going to dig in and get started. All right, now we're ready. I had to turn the gas on in here so that we can uh, have access to our Bunsen burners. All right, so guys, I'm gonna darken the room uh, so that it's easier for you to see what we're talking about here. But guys, turning to the first page and allow me to click so that I can pull up the first page as well. Guys, the very first skill that we are going to talk about today is how to make your Bunsen burner turn into this. So guys, you have the image in black and white. I have it in color up on my screen. But guys, ultimately, one of the things that you've got to figure out how to do is make your Bunsen burner do this. <clears throat> Again, guys, along the way, you're scratching notes to yourself. But guys, the important thing to notice in this picture is you'll notice that this, and you may want to write this down next to the picture so you know what you're looking for. Guys, when you light your Bunsen burner properly, you are looking for this two part flame. That's what it's called. It's called a two part flame. And this, uh oh, this part, why is it not letting me draw? Hold on. Huh. All right, well, we can go without it for now. Um, so, guys, it's not going to let me draw on the board right now. I'm not sure why. But this inner part of the flame is the hottest part of the flame. And you may want to make note of that because you're going to find out that that's going to be important relative to the way that you set up your Bunsen burner. So, guys, let me introduce you to this thing, and then we're going to talk about how to make this work effectively. Now guys, here's the deal. This is probably going to be one of the most frustrating things you've ever done in your life. It will take you five to 35 minutes to finally get this thing to light. But guys, understand increasingly throughout time, you'll get better at this. But again, you got to figure out how to make this do that. So guys, in order to do this, let's go through the steps that you're going to do in order to get this to light. So guys, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to shut down your Bunsen burner. And here's how you do it. On the Bunsen burner, there's a needle valve. And what you're going to do is you're going to screw this needle valve in until it's completely closed. Guys, do not hesitate to pick this thing up. Then the other thing that you're going to shut down is this. Down at the bottom of the barrel of the Bunsen burner, there are vents. And you are going to turn this outer collar until those vents are closed, and now your Bunsen burner is shut down. So you may want to make note to yourself that there's two things you're shutting down, the valve and the vents, which conveniently both begin with V, and that all works out great. Now guys, the next thing that you're going to do is you are going to turn on the gas tap to your burner. And guys, if you look up here with me, uh, my gas tap is here. Yours are on your benches. The difference is yours are horizontal, mine are vertical. In either case, if you listen carefully, when the handle lines up with the nozzle, then the gas is flowing. So anytime the handle and nozzle are perpendicular, it's off and when they are aligned parallel, it is flowing. Now guys, understand when you mess around with your Bunsen burners, you're welcome to pick them up, but don't disconnect them. I just did that to show you how they work. So guys, the next thing you're gonna do then, part two is turn on the gas. Talk to me about why the gas is not flowing because the valve is closed. Guys, that's why you close the valve in part one. Now part three, what you're going to do is you're going to open the needle valve until you hear the gas flow. And guys, understand this can be hard to do in a loud room. So what you can do if you need to, you can hear that, right? But if you can't, you can hold it up to your ear and you can actually feel it blow in your ear. And you turn on the gas to the Bunsen burner. Now guys, I'm not going to let this flow because it's going to make us all sick as the room fills with gas. 
because we got to talk about part four. In order to light the Bunsen burner, you got to figure out how to make this thing spark. That's yeah, a welding striker. It's called a hooded striker. So guys, you can squeeze this thing until your hand cramps up and it will never light. So how do you get this to spark? Ready? Write down the four words, left-handed gangster gun. If you can remember, seriously, if you can remember left-handed gangster gun, you can get this thing to light. It can't be right-handed. It can't be a traditional gun. It has to be a gangster gun. So guys, here's how this works. You are going to make a left-handed gangster gun. This is a left-handed gun, but you got to go gangster. Okay? Now that you got your left-handed gangster gun, here's what you're going to do. You're going to take the striker in your right hand, and you're going to put the hood of the striker on the barrel of your gun, and then you're going to hook the hammer, your thumb, around this leg of the striker, and you are going to squeeze so stinking hard that it leaves a crease in your thumb. And when you do that, this thing sparks like crazy. That's what, that was cool. That's what you got to do in order to get this thing to light. So, you then bring this over here by the, by the uh, Bunsen burner, sneak up on it from the side, <coughs> and light your Bunsen burner. Now guys, compare. My flame compared to that flame. Good? Bad. Guys, here's the deal. This is a very, very low efficiency flame. It will burn you if you leave your hand there long enough, but this will never boil water. This will never get hot enough to cause reactions to happen. So guys, then the question is, how do we turn this into that? And the answer is right here. You adjust your flame by changing the valve to adjust the height and by changing the barrel to adjust the heat. So guys, let me darken the room a little bit more and then let me show you what all that means. So here's what you're going to do. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to adjust the height by adjusting the barrel. This is a little bit too high. You want a flame that's initially about three to four inches tall. This is a little too big. So I'm going to screw this in and I'm going to bring the flame down. Now what we're going to do is we're going to adjust the heat and you do that by changing this vent at the bottom and guys notice what happens when I do. That's the flame that you're after. That two part flame with the very hottest part in the middle and you'll know you've got it right when that inner hottest part of the flame is about an inch and a half tall. If you want to write that down as well, it's not a bad idea. So guys, you are looking for about a three centimeter, about an inch and a half tall inner flame. Then guys, once you've done that, this is not in the slides, but I would definitely encourage you to make note of this. Then you need to adjust your ring stand. I would in your notes, what is this step number five? I would draw an arrow above step six and I would just write adjust the ring stand. Guys, if you don't do this, you're going to get burned later. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So this is the mistake you're going to make. You're going to come along and your ring stand is going to be like this. And eventually you're going to put a beaker or something on here and you're going to try to heat up some water or something like that. And the problem is, is that there's so much distance between your flame and the, and the ring stand that it doesn't get hot enough. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to set this Bunsen burner on there. And then you're going to adjust this until the ring is level with the hottest part of the flame. If you don't do that right away, then that ring and everything else there that's metal is going to heat up. Not enough to boil water, but enough to burn you. Even this little set screw back here. And if you let this sit for a couple minutes, you're going to find that you can't adjust it because it's just too hot. So guys, adjust it immediately. Set it up like that. That is what a well-adjusted and set up Bunsen burner ring stand looks like. You guys good? Okay. Then guys, the last step is this. And it's simply to shut off the burner when you're done. But guys, never shut off a burner at the, at the valve. You always shut the burner off at the tap because that is the, um, 
the leak proof valve. The Bunsen burners actually will leak, um, so shut it off at the valve. So guys, there you have it. Questions on Bunsen burner stuff? Again, guys, don't, you're going to get frustrated with this. It's a lot harder than it looks. Um, I'm hoping that on Wednesday I can give you a little bit of time to practice before we go live. Um, but realize, I don't, and guys, this is true for all of us. I don't expect you to be good at this. I just expect you to be moving towards being good at this. So I want to see gangster guns. I want all of that good stuff because understand this is a little frustrating and you'll get better at it over time. All right, so are we good on Bunsen burners? Okay, let's keep going. So guys, I'm going to just rock it through this next one because you already should understand this stuff. If you don't, <coughs> um, please let me know. Um, but guys, using a balance. This is a skill that you've got to have. These are the important things that we've talked about. This should come as no surprise. You never put chemicals on the balance. Guys, remember that we always use what is called a weighing boat. And did I show you this trick? That you can take a weighing boat and fold the corners and it turns into a pour spout. Huh? Not bad. All right. So then, guys, when you approach a balance, always re-zero it before you make a measurement. And then, obviously, we don't estimate with a display like that because it's a digital display. No surprises there, right? You guys all good? All right. So then, guys, moving along, graduated cylinders. <clears throat> when we did the measurement activity a couple days ago, guys, some of you did this well. Some of you actually even came and asked me. You were like, wait a minute, what do we do about this? And if you did ask, I, I actually talked with you about it. But guys, now we need to understand this together so that we're all doing this right. So guys, when you read volumes with a graduated cylinder, there are two important things that you need to be thinking about. Guys, I would make note next to this that these are terms that will be on the test. These two terms, meniscus and parallax, are terms that you will be held accountable for on the test, um, so just commit them to memory. So guys, let's talk about this. Um, some of you, when you were uh, measuring the volume of the alcohol and the acetone in the activity the other day, came to me and you're like, wait a minute, there's a dip, there's a, there's a curve in the surface of this liquid, where do we measure from? Do you remember what I told you? Was it not someone in this class? And guys, let's just say it. So guys, that curve is called the meniscus. So guys, the meniscus is a concave up surface on the top of the liquid, and it actually does look like this. Maybe some of you remember, but guys, the rule is this. Always measure from the bottom of the meniscus, and that's not in your notes, so I would include it. So when you are making measurements with a graduated cylinder, you always measure from the bottom of the meniscus. But then guys, we've got another problem when we make measurements using a graduated cylinder, and that is the problem of parallax. The definition is obviously in front of you. Parallax is error in measurement caused by misalignment. But guys, the deal is this. Liam, I'm gonna come hang out with you. So guys, if we're trying to measure the volume of the liquid in this graduated cylinder, you see the issue? I'm not lined up. My eye needs to be level with the bottom of the meniscus in the scale. So how do we do that? How do we cut down on parallax? Well, you got two options. You can either pick this up or you can drop your butt down. Guys, I suggest, especially because our counter heights are higher, I would drop your butt. That way you're not shaking trying to make a measurement. But when you're reading a graduated cylinder, you want to get right down here, eye level, get lined up properly as you're, as you're making volume measurements. That makes sense, right? And then guys, finally this, when you make these measurements, you already know this, you will always estimate one decimal place past the accuracy of the scale. If you don't do that, even starting in the next lab, because understand these are expectations I'm gonna hold you accountable to. So when you're making measurements, you're thinking through what you're doing and you're estimating when appropriate. All right, big deep breath. Guys, any questions there? Y'all good? Are we three for three? Oh. You guys must have a good teacher. <clears throat> All right. So guys, number four, filtering. When you go into lab next time, well, Friday, not Wednesday, but Friday. You go into lab on Friday, guys. Uh, you are actually going to be separating what we call a heterogeneous mixture. It's a mixture made of many parts. 
And you're going to separate this heterogeneous mixture through a process we call filtering. Let me show you how to do this. Guys, this is what is called filter paper. And the tricky bit with filter paper is you've got to figure out how to make this fit in here. Here's how to do it. You have the steps in front of you. How many steps are there? Are they numbered? Six. Six. All right, so I'm going to just bring them up. <coughs> Perfect. All right. For some of you, this is going to feel really familiar. You know in kindergarten where you take a piece of paper and you fold it up and then you cut it and you fold it open and then it's a snowflake? Same idea. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to fold this in half once. You're going to fold this in half twice. Aha! Now it's starting to look like this. The problem is, is right now it's two-dimensional and you need to make it 3D. So you're going to take the paper, fold it in half twice, and then when you look at it down this edge, you'll notice that there are four pleats. You are going to open this between pleats one and three. It doesn't matter which one you call one and which one you call three. You're just going to stick your finger in there, and when you do, you'll find that this thing then actually forms a cone that perfectly fits in our funnels. But guys, we've got a problem, and I know you can't see this. You're just going to have to trust me. When you put this in here, this pleat, let me see if I can do this. So guys, this pleat right here actually causes a ridge that keeps the paper from sealing to the funnel. So here's what you're going to do. Once you get this done, you're going to then pull it back out and you're going to take this flappy corner and you're going to rip off about a centimeter of the flappy corner. Then when you put this back in the funnel, it fits perfectly and there is no longer a lip there and everything sits down better. The problem though is this still will not sit well in your funnel. So guys, the last thing you're gonna do is you're gonna come to your sink, you're gonna put a little water in here, slosh it around, that causes it to stick and you're out the door. And then, when you're filtering, guys, make sure that you do not pour liquid in this above the edge of the filter paper or it leaks around and you're gonna get stuff contaminating your filtrate and that's a bad thing. So guys, how are we doing on filtering? Are we done with skills or is there something else? I don't have the notes in front of me. Are we moving on to techniques now? Beautiful, okay. So guys, in review, these are the skills that we just talked about. So you've got Bunsen burner, balance, which we've done before, graduated cylinder, which you've seen before, but we fine tuned that a little bit, and then about how to fold up filter paper. By the way, guys, when you do this filtering, we have clamps on our ring stands that will hold the filter. What you're going to do is just open this up and then run the schnozzle of the filter into there and that's how you're going to filter. You'll see. All right. So guys, are we good with the skills? It's the schnozzle. That is a technical term. Two O's. Schnozzle. Yep. All right. You guys good? Okay. So now guys, we've got to talk about techniques. How are techniques different than skills? And the answer is, you could fake this, you could ignore this, you could never learn these things and probably be okay. But guys, understand, these are things that you need to know because in this space, we don't just try to do things, we try to do things well. And so we are gonna talk about some techniques that you need to use that will make you more successful as we go throughout the year. Now guys, these skills, these techniques include um, dispensing liquids. And you're going, wait a minute, I'm seriously gonna learn how to pour liquids? And guys, the answer is absolutely. Here's why. Oh, let me grab, eh, grab this, and maybe we'll grab this. Oh, and there's another one. Grab this. All right. So, guys, why, it is, why is it important that you know how to pour? And the answer is this. You're going to go into lab and increasingly throughout the year, there are going to be more and more chemicals 
sitting out for you as you're working in lab. And you're going to come along and you're going to be like, hey, and by the way, this is all just water and alcohol, so I don't need goggles. And you're going to be like, hey, yo, I need some of this. And then you're going to come along, and I need a little bit of that. And then someone else is going to come along, and I need some of this. And I'll look at all this alcohol. We'll get some of that. And then here's some more alcohol, and I need some. And guys, by the time the lab's over, my counter looks like this. Do you see the problem? Exactly. You don't know which lid goes with which bottle. Of course, this isn't going to be a problem for you guys because I don't clean up after you. So you're going to understand that you're going to keep things neat as you go. But guys, regardless, we have a problem. Understand in the university setting, if you screw this up, they will immediately fine you the cost of whatever's in the bottles. So guys, how do we avoid the problem? Because if we don't know which lid goes on which bottle, and I was careful to do this and I sort of know which goes where, because if we don't know which lid goes on which bottle, if we start cross-capping these bottles, we contaminate everything in the bottle, which screws up everybody else's lab for the rest of the day. That's why the universities fine you for this, because they have to then go pour this down the drain and start over. So guys, how do we avoid the problem? And it goes like this. Never ever will you put a cap down on a countertop. If you need some liquid, and I'll just grab the one that's just water, because if you need some liquid, what you're going to do is you're going to screw the lid, off the, the lid off the bottle, and then you're going to put the lid in your dominant hand. This is called palming the lid. And then you're going to trap the lid between your palm and the bottle. And now that bottle and that lid will never be separated. Then, guys, this. You're going to come along and you're going to get the liquid that you need. But what if you get too much? What do you do with the extra? What don't you do with the extra? Never pour back into a stock bottle. Guys, these are understood to be clean. If you do this, you don't know where this graduated cylinder has been and it's contaminated. Guys, do not let me catch you pouring stuff back into stock bottles. So you come along, you get what you need. When you're done, you screw the lid back onto the bottle and you're all set. Now guys, what happens if you do get too much? Where does it go? And the answer is down the drain or in a waste beaker, depending on if it's dangerous and I'll always let you know. But guys, please don't ever pour back in into, just into stock bottles, okay? All right, so that works great if you need like 20 milliliters of solution. But guys, what if you only need one? What if you only need one milliliter of solution? Well, guys, this only measures down to five. It doesn't even have markings smaller than five. So how do we measure one milliliter if we can't do it with a graduated cylinder? Do you, yeah, do you remember what we did in the, in the activity? Yeah, guys, what we do is we use these things, and they're called volumetric pipettes. Ooh, that sounds important. Guys, these are what are called volumetric pipettes, and this very top line is one milliliter. So here's what you do. Say you need a milliliter of this, which is just water, so you come along, you screw off the lid, you sit it down, and the... Uh-oh. Put the cap in the palm of your hand. And then, guys, what you're going to do is this. You're going to take this dropper and you're going to squeeze it, and you are going to slurp it overly full. Then what you're going to do is you're going to drip this down until the meniscus is sitting on the one milliliter line. Then once it's there, you will release this, drawing that milliliter of liquid up into the bulb of the dropper, and you're good to go. Now, guys, why is it that I was able to drip this stuff back in here? Well, yes, but why did that not contaminate what was in the bottle? That's the only place this has ever been. This dropper started sterile, and the only place that it's ever been is in this bottle. So because this is a clean relationship, we don't have to worry about this contaminating this. You get your milliliter, you put it wherever you need it, you put this back in there, you screw the lid on, and you're good to go. So guys, that is what is called the process of transferring. And again, here we can put stuff back in the bottles because that's clean and safe. You guys good on transferring? You good on pouring? All right. <clears throat> so then, guys, one more skill or one more um, technique <clears throat> that you need to be aware of. 
And guys, this is how we dispense and weigh solids. This is what is called the tap technique. Now guys, understand that this is also all about contamination. So how many points do we have here? Four? Is there a fifth? No, that's it. Okay. So guys, these are the things that you need to keep in mind as we're talking about how to dispense solids. Again, it's about contamination. Again, we use weighing boats. And guys, we will use what is called the tap method. So here's how you do this. This is just uh, table salt. So say that we need a gram of table salt. Here's what you're going to do. Because you're going to come along, you're going to put a weighing boat on the balance, and then you're going to hit re-zero. Then you're going to get the supply beaker for whatever solids you need. And now, guys, we got to think about this. This is what is called a chemistry spoon. If you bring your own chemistry spoon, if there's not one there, if you bring your own chemistry spoon, this is contaminated. If there's already one in the beaker, it's a different story. So, guys, let's say that we bring our own chemistry spoon. So what are we going to do? So we're going to come along, we're going to put this on there, we're going to hit re-zero. Then guys, you're going to scoop up a big old scoop of salt. And then here's how you do this. Put your elbows on the counter and then hold the scoop above the weighing boat and you tap on it. And as you do, you're not watching the salt, you're watching the display. And as you do this, you're dispensing salt, dispensing salt, dispensing salt. You're creeping up on a gram. Now guys, what happens if you go past a gram? What do you do? This is where it depends. If you brought this scoop with you, then this cannot go back in there. If this came with this, then it's clean and you can put it back. And this one did, so we're good. But guys, now I've got too much salt inside of here, so what do I do? What you do is this. You pick this up, you scoop up some of that salt, and when you put it back, now it should weigh less than a gram. Then you're going to come and you're going to carefully tap method again, get up to a gram, and then if, uh, if this came in the speaker, you can just put that back and you're all done. Now guys, what if this scoop did not come with the beaker? How does that change the game? Then you can't put the salt back in the beaker because this is contaminated. So what do you do with the extra salt? It goes in the trash. So guys, that's the tap method. Yeah? Yeah, good question. And the answer is because when, when this becomes contaminated, the minute we pick this up, it's contaminated. But that's between you and your stuff. This should be relatively clean. So if it is contaminated, all that you've done is you've contaminated your sample. And so that may throw you off, but if you put it back in there, it contaminates everybody's sample, and it would then throw everybody off. So understand, contamination at some level is unavoidable, but we try to contain it. Does that make sense? So we're trying to limit the contamination to one experiment rather than everybody's. But you're right. And so typically, you don't want to run these underwater to clean them because they never quite dry and stuff sticks to them. But you can always wipe them off. And frankly, later in lab where we're doing more and more complicated experiments, we'll clean them by putting them in the Bunsen burner and we'll burn off the stuff that's on them. So, and actually in AP what we do is we, uh, we rinse them in what's called cyclohexane and that really cleans them off. So, yeah. Uh, no, it's actually not an acid at all. It's not acidic. It's kind of like industrial strength nail polish remover. Yeah, it's, and it's crazy flammable. Um, so, all right. So, guys, you okay with this? Man, we're cruising. This is awesome. <clears throat> so, guys, wrapping up then... We're not close to done, but we are now transitioning <clears throat> into the last thing that we need to do. <clears throat> so guys, throughout the last few days, we've been talking about how to make measurements. We've been talking about how to estimate in measurements. We've been talking about significant digits. We've had a lot of interesting conversations about how we deal with numbers. Well, guys, today we're going to wrap this up. We're now going to take these numbers and we're going to do math with them. 
and I'm going to explain to you the rules that we will be using mathematically as we do these calculations. In addition to that, I'm also going to show you the accepted forms for how we represent these calculations. Guys, understand these are not suggestions. These are not neat ideas that you can evaluate and decide whether or not you think they're worth doing. These are not my rules and structures. These are the accepted ways of doing these things, and we don't have a choice. I have to use them. You have to use them. We're going to use them together. So with that said, <clears throat> let's first of all talk about a concept called finding mass by difference. Be ready to write this down. So guys, finding mass by difference, and we already talked about this before. Remember the idea of the beaker and the beaker plus the sugar? Me and my dog had to pick up my dog. Remember the stories? Okay. So guys, that whole idea is about something called mass by difference. The idea is this. When we weigh something, typically what we will do is we will weigh a container. Then we will add a substance to the container, then we'll weigh the container in the substance, and then in calculations we'll subtract to find the weight of the substance. This is called finding mass by difference. So guys, on these lines, please with me, let's see if I can record data. Yeah, for some reason it's not letting me write. <clears throat> so let's just do this. Um, I'm going to give you some data. Oh boy. That's a mess. You know what? Let me do this. Because I'm realizing that I'm recording this, and if I write this on the board, it doesn't do the screencast viewers any good. Let me see what happens if I escape out of this. And then let me quit this. Uh, move your... Oh, that's what's going on. Just a second. Yes. Now I should be able to write. I'm a genius. All right, here we go. Actually, I got lucky, but that kind of looks like smart. Okay, here we go. Now we're cooking. So boom, 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 boom. Perfect. All right. So guys, now we're ready to do this for real. So imagine that we are <clears throat> making a measurement and we want to find the, me the, the weight of some salt. So we put a beaker on the balance and we find out that that beaker weighs 120.00 grams. Write these down with me. <clears throat> And we do include those zeros because while they are not there to change the value of the number, they communicate accuracy. By the way, guys, how many significant digits? Five. Yep. Those two zeros on the right are final zeros after the decimal. The other zeros trapped. That's all five. So then, guys, imagine that we add some salt and we come along and we reweigh this. And now this weighs 121.23 grams. <clears throat> what is the salt weigh? 1.23 grams. And guys, obviously all of you can do that math in your head. The question that we need to talk about is how do we represent this? And guys, here's the deal. You don't have a choice in this. You need to learn this representative process and use it when you're doing mass by difference every single time. So guys, I'm going to show you how to do this. Join me at the bottom and let's do it. So in order to figure out the mass of the salt, we need to subtract. But first we need to tell our reader what we're subtracting. So we go like this. Mass, beaker, and salt minus the mass of the beaker results in the mass of the salt. That is the only way to represent this calculation. <clears throat> Guys, notice that it is in columns. Notice that you can read it. Notice that it is not sloping up or sloping down. 
we are going to represent our, our calculations well. So this is the subtraction that we did. Mass of the beaker and the salt minus the mass of the beaker gives us the mass of the salt. Then we need to show our readers what those numbers actually are. You have the advantage of having lined paper. I don't have any, but we're going to do this. We're going to move across and the mass of, leaving a little space, the mass of our beaker in salt is 121.2 three grams. <clears throat> then we are subtracting from that the mass of the beaker. Guys, notice I'm going to line up my digits in my decimals. This is 120.00 grams, and that results in the mass of the salt, which is 1.23 grams. This and only this is how we represent mass by difference. We don't do it in sentence form. <clears throat> we do it in columns. We don't write the numbers first. We write the setup first. Guys, just commit this to memory. This is the way we do this. Notice that you do have it in your notes. So when you're writing up this first lab next Wednesday, you will have an example in front of you. But guys, this is the way to represent mass by difference. You guys good? Okay. So then guys, moving along, the next thing that we need to talk about is finally then significant digits in calculations. And guys, I'm going to encourage you to, uh, to underline some words here. You guys know how to figure out how many significant digits are in a number. But guys, when you do the math with these numbers, you need to learn how to round the results. And this is the way that we do it. When you are multiplying and dividing, it's always rounded to the least accurate number in the calculation. When you are adding and subtracting, it's about decimal places and not significant digits. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm coughing. I went for a really long bike ride yesterday and in this smoky air, oh my gosh, it irritated my lungs. So I feel fine, I'm just coffin because I shouldn't have ridden yesterday. Anyway, what's that? I know, it's ridiculous. You can actually taste it again. It kills me. No, it's bad. All right, so guys, grab your calculators and let's do some math. So we've got this and this. Notice, guys, we've got the same numbers the difference is one is multiplication and one is or one is subtraction. So working the numbers on the left, we have 125.5 times 2.3. <clears throat> and writing down what my calculator says, I get 2886500. But guys, that's wrong. The reason that that is wrong is we are telling the world that we can measure down to hundred thousandths of a gram. We can't do that. So guys, in order to make this answer appropriate, what we've got to do is we've got to base it on the place that it came from. So guys, let's talk. How many significant digits are in this top number? Five. If it's helpful to write that down, I'd encourage you to do it. <clears throat> then, guys, what about the second one? Well, that's only two. So here's the rule. Your answer can only be as accurate as your least accurate factor. So our least accurate factor only has two significant digits, so we only get two significant digits in our answer, and that makes our answer 290 grams. Now, guys, if you can't round that top number to two significant digits and come up with 290, you have now identified a gap in your understanding. And it's your responsibility to address that. I would encourage you to come get help before or after school during our, our gap time, but I would love to help. Yes, ma'am. Uh, because I have it set up that way. Yeah, I actually have my calculator set up to give me um, five decimal places. Um, calculate you. Mo 
Well, I don't think you can with yours, but some of the more complicated calculators, it's called fixing the decimal. And so, um, yeah. Um, so that I can show you what rounding looks like. Yeah, yeah, that's right. All right, guys, questions on that? Okay, now let's do this. It's time to subtract. I'm pretty good at subtracting. This is one, this is two, this is three, this is two, this is zero, this is grams. Kind of like the calculation that we did when we did mass by difference. But now we need to round. Guys, don't miss this. Answer this question. How many significant digits are in the top number? Doesn't matter. Guys, don't miss this. It does not matter. Because when we add and subtract, we don't care about significant digits. We care about decimal places. So here we have two decimal places. Here we have one decimal place. We get the fewest decimal places in our answer. So this would be 123.2 grams. Guys, this is where things get a little more challenging in this class. And guys, I'm just going to say this, and if you find this offensive, that's okay. But guys, last year was one of the hardest academic years for me. Not because it was hard for me to manage being an online teacher during COVID, but because I had to watch my children learn from Canvas. And guys, understand Canvas was an amazing tool and it came at just the right time and we couldn't have done what we did without it. But guys, for some of you, it's been almost two years since you have turned in or represented or submitted work that wasn't typing things in a stupid little box in Canvas. And guys, understand Literally, as I was watching my daughter do her physics homework and get questions wrong simply because she didn't leave a space between the number and the units, there was this anger that turned into sadness as I was watching her get rattled by canvas. So guys, I understand that for some of you, you have lost the habit of attending to details. And guys, that's going to be one of the beautiful things that we're going to work on together throughout this year. We're going to talk about the difference between multiplication and subtraction and significant digits and decimal places. But guys, for some of you, I, I know this is going to be a struggle. Not because you're not capable of it, but because you haven't been asked to think in this way in a long time. So we're going to sort of, we're going to increasingly gather a hold of these ideas. So guys, any questions there? You're okay? Okay. Let's see. Last thing we're going to do today, and it goes like this. Representing error. Guys, at the end of every, well, the vast majority of the labs that we do, the very last thing that we'll do is we'll calculate what's called our percent error. How wrong were we? How far off were we? And guys, in order to do that, this is the equation that we will use. It's in your notes, right? Is it there? Okay. So guys, let's tear this equation apart. First of all, this, what do the vertical bars in the numerator mean? They're absolute value bars, which simply means what? Never negative. It is distance from zero. It's never negative. Our percent errors will always be positive. But then guys, what do the numbers mean? Well, the numbers go like this. We have a measured value. That is your value. That is the value that you got back from your experimentation. Some people call it the experimental value. Then, guys, we also have the accepted value. Some people call it the theoretical value. That is the correct answer. That's what you're shooting for. But, guys, I know the equation looks crazy, but do this with me. Imagine that after the first test in this class, you get your test back. And you got a 97%. Nice job. But if you get a 97%, what percent did you get wrong? Three. That's all this equation does. 
it would simply be 97, what you got, minus the accepted value, the, 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 is 100. So it'd be 97 minus 100 divided by 100 times 100. That works out to three. Because that's all this is about. Gets a little more, what's that? <laughs> we don't do that in here. Okay. So, guys, let's then talk about how this works. Go ahead. Why are you dividing by 110? Yeah, good question. And so understand that in, in the example that I gave you, it was a 100-point test. So this comes up with the decimal value. This converts it into a percentage. Okay. So, guys, read along with me. It's, do you have this on the next page? Oh, boy. So guys, it says this. You go into lab on Friday. This is really what we're going to do. You go into lab, not next time, but on Friday. And you expect to collect 1.03 grams of salt. At the end of the lab, you only got 0.78 grams of salt. What's your percent error? Don't touch your calculators. And we can estimate. But guys, this is how to solve this problem. Do this with me so that you have an example. And guys, please, if you're rushing through calculations, and again, Canvas, I get it, right? You've never, for the last two years, you haven't seen anybody look at your work. It's just been typing numbers into Canvas, and I get that. We're going to slow down and do this right. Grab something you can write with, and guys, set an example. Here we go. First thing you're going to do is write down the equation. Please don't ask the question, do we need to write down our equations? Guys, that tells me that you're already looking to cut corners. And we're going to do quality work in here every single time because it's the right thing to do. So guys, we're going to write down the equation. I have a degree in chemistry and I've been doing this for 30 years, guys. And every time I solve this equation, I write it down first. Celebrate doing things well. And then, guys, after that, we're going to start plugging in values. So we've got two numbers. We've got 1.03 and we've got 0.78. Which one of those numbers is the amount that we measured at the end of the lab? 0.78. So we're going to go percent error is equal to 0.78 grams. minus the amount that we wanted to get. Yeah, good. 1.03 grams, absolute value. Then, guys, divided by 1.03 grams and times 100. So, Zach, do you see now how we divided by 100 in that, that silly example? But what we divide by is the amount we should have got. Yeah. Now, guys, slow down. If you don't, you're going to get these wrong. So let's talk about how to solve this problem. Guys, in order to do this, the first thing that we are going to do is we're going to count significant digits. How many significant digits are in 0.78? Two. If you want to write this down, you can. How many significant digits are in 1.03? Three. How many significant digits? Well, 1.03 is three. Guys, how many significant digits are in 100? No. 100 is infinite. This is not a measurement. It is simply a number that's converting a decimal into a percentage. That 100 does not limit significant digits because it's not a measurement. So with that in mind, then, we need to do the math to solve this. So guys, I'm going to get rid of my numbers. But when we do the math, we evaluate the numerator first. And we're subtracting. So guys, when we subtract, how many significant digits do we get in our answer? You don't. It doesn't matter. Gray, right? What does matter? Decimals. So guys, two decimals here, three decimals there. When we do that subtraction, it's negative 0.25 grams because we get two decimal places, not two significant digits. Then we bring down our 1.03 and multiply it by 100.
Now, guys, we're ready to do the math. Just one second. Now we're ready to do the math. So we're going to go 0.25 divided by 1.03 and times 100. And I get 24.27184%. But now, guys, we need to round. Notice that I got rid of the negative because of the absolute value bars. But now we need significant digits again. Because how many significant digits are in 0.25? Two. Down here we've got three. That gives us two. And to two significant digits, that's 24%. But guys, notice that the significant digits are determined by the result of the subtraction. You got to be careful. Make sure you're writing down the result of that subtraction first. Now you have a model in front of you. We will be doing this for the rest of the year. That packet of papers that you now have goes in the lab section of your binder. Zach, you had a question. Yeah, what you Okay. Yeah. You could. Yeah, you could just drop that because that's what the bars mean. That's fine. So, guys, now that you have this in the in the lab section of your binder, grab your homework packet. We are now, guys, on assignment number two in your homework packet. It says lab procedures and percent error homework. So guys, just briefly, paging front to back, you'll notice that it's two pages. You will do the entire back. You can write the answers on the paper as given. But then, guys, on the front, there are seven questions on the front, and they're all percent error calculations. So, guys, this is my thinking. These are very redundant. They're repetitious. I would suggest that if you can do a few, you can probably do a lot. So here's what we're going to do. On Wednesday, we are going to grade only numbers one and two. If you would like to do three through seven for practice, the answers are on our website and that's fine. Because I don't want to waste your time. Do one and two. If you're comfortable with them, you're probably okay. If you're not, keep going. But guys, when on Wednesday I ask you the question, are you done? It will just be referring to one and two. Now, do not solve these on this piece of paper. Grab another sheet of paper, make it part of your homework, and solve them on there. Guys, that's the other, well, one of the other many things that broke my heart about watching my daughter work on Canvas is she forgot how to represent calculations well. We're always going to work in big spaces, clean spaces, and we're going to take the time to do things well. So guys, grab another sheet of paper. We're going to do one and two. The answers are up here on the wall. Um, guys, feel free to check as you go. Um, we are done today at 9.05. Oh, man. Guys, you have almost 20 minutes. There's a very real chance you'll get these done today. So guys, let's guys, look in, in let's get to work, let's get as much done as, as, as we possibly can. 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 Ask, ask, ask questions, questions that you need. Let's get to work. Don't ask. Don't ask.